can we continue with our commentary on using love as a complete book about how to live our lives so that we're ready for death and how to die as well as how to live the life ready for death, how to die well. <coughs> Yeah, that was our motivation. No need for any prayers, don't worry about prayers. We need the Buddha, this is teachings. Be happy we found the Buddha. There's your refuge that we just done. Okay. So I heard the book had run out, but I just looked up and it said came and seemed it popped up to be able to buy it, so I don't know what's going on. I really recommend you get the you get the digital one or you can get the other one. Yeah, I really recommend, highly recommend. It's um, a series of it's a series of parts. Sort of the back of the part, this first series of parts, part one, part two, part three, are all kind of preparation, basic this and that. You know, let me just read out the content and you get a sense of it. Yeah. How to face death without fear. How to face death without fear. Published by Wisdom Publications by Norman Berta. So, like, you know, the part, um, part one, how to think about death, you know, and in reincarnation. What happens after death? Everyone dies. Death is easy when you've given up attachment. Get ready for death by living life with a good heart. Then there's a chapter there on pray to be reborn in Amitabha's pure land, and I'll talk about that. Then part two, how, to, how, we, how we go from one life to the next. This is process, what happens at death. Then there's a discussion of the 12 links and dependent arising at the time of death. The stages of death. And then there's a really delicious chapter on the death of what the yogis have been waiting for. Make it sounds delicious, okay? Then part three uh, and part four and part five are all the practices. It's really just advice. And then two thirds of the book is actually the back, which is all the practices numbered from one to eighty-seven, because they're repeated. They're repeatedly referred to in the process. So they're all there back. But the mantras, the sutras, the things to read, the meditations to do. You know, name or so many different practices that Rishi recommends. So part three is all the practices to do the weeks and you know the weeks and months before death. Then part four is the practices to do the hours and days before death. And then part three, part five is what to do after the mind has left the body. So it's in chronological order. And there's and there's listing of all these different kinds of practices to do. You know, so so helpful. Excuse me. It's a little tough to hear you. Could you possibly adjust the microphone when you have a moment? I'm so sorry to interrupt. Thank you. No problem. Okay, thank you so much. All I can say is when I use my computer, nobody complains about the mic. It's perfect. I use the self-computer in my computer, and I've never had anybody say they can't hear me. And I know I can hear very loudly in the room. Yeah, well, if we turn off the room microphone. So why don't we do that, and I'll get my computer. Shall we do that? We can hear you now. At least I can. I, know, I, I won't if, speak for everyone. If I if I turn away, you can't hear me so well. So what was this? That's the the one you're wearing here. That's for the room. Oh, we don't. You don't need one for me so for the room, do you? You guys don't need a mic. So what about now? I'm just going to talk in different directions. So tell me if I, if you're hearing me now. Chat, chat, chat. Can you hear me now? I'm turning to the left. I'm turning to the right. Can you hear me now? Sweetheart, you have to answer me. You have to answer me. Who yes, I absolutely thing? can. And it seems that there's some other folks giving thumbs up as well. So I think we can hear you. Thank you so much for the adjustment. Hear me now. Okay, this is better. Because in the room, you don't need me. I mean, I already have a, my self-built microphone, isn't it? Okay, good. That's better. Now we've got it. Thank you. This is brilliant. <coughs> okay, so yeah so okay so the whole point of why death certainly the way Lama Zopa talks and this is the tibetan buddhist approach why it's important to live your life in readiness for death which means to realize impermanence and get in touch with it therefore realize you don't want to waste your life therefore living in good ethics therefore be ready at the time of death and then even more why to then learn these more sophisticated technical things that come from the vajrayana to help you actually navigate the death process which is why death is what the yogis have been waiting for why all of that why why is it so intensive why because as lama Zopa says 
at the time of death is when the karmic seeds that will be the ones that will be triggered in your mind that will determine your next life. So it's, abs it's absolutely vital to be ready for death and to die well. It's not just sort of a nice romantic notion, you know, everybody dies well and everybody's crying and holding hands and it's lovely and then goodbye. It's, t it's, it's like incredible. It's like learning how you've got to learn how to drive so you can drive on the freeway. So it's just a nice thing. You've got to know how to do it. It's a technical thing. Because, and then given, hello, given that we've got out, you know, like we talked yesterday, and the mind goes back and back and goes forward, forward. Second, let's go into more detail today about karma. This natural law, according to Buddha, this natural law that basically runs the universe or the natural law within which the universe runs, the natural law within which our minds run. Given that that every second, whatever we think and do and say, without exception, is what so is so seeds in our mind, and that those seeds are then are stored in our mind, and then we need access at the time of death to really delicious, non non harming, virtuous karmic seeds to be triggered, to be available, to be triggered, to be ready to be triggered because then that will determine our next life. So the condition that enables the virtuous karmic seeds to be triggered is for you to be having to be peaceful and virtuous at the time of death. So if you're having a panic attack and freaking out, and as Lama Zopa says, the commonest thing is most people die with fear because we live in denial of it. We, we don't know what's going to happen. We're terrified of the black hole. We have no idea. We don't know how to live our lives. We, we live in denial of death. And when it comes, it's just unbearable. And why there's so much fear is because of incredible, incredible attachment. And more than anything at the time of death, attachment to this, this body. Because as far as we're concerned, this is me, isn't it? So it's this absolute primordial attachment, this fear that triggers incredible fear in most people. And most animals automatically. You know. So that is the worst way to die. I mean, it sounds like you're going to have a panic attack hearing about it. Because that, when you, you see the basic idea about how karma works, let's go into this today, especially at the time of death, is you know, like we just discussed briefly yesterday, we've got positive, appropriate, virtuous, useful, productive, beneficial actions such as mental states and then actions on the basis of those such as love and kindness and compassion and generosity and forgiveness and then actions based on those they leave virtuous karmic seeds in the mind positive karmic seeds useful karmic seeds tendencies and we want those, we want those to be available and to be to prevail and the, and, the, and the condition that enables virtuous, positive karmic seeds to be triggered, and we have billions of all of both of them, the negative as well, in our mind, is to be peaceful. Because as soon as you're not peaceful and you're freaking out, that automatically triggers negative karmic seeds. And this is not a moralistic issue. It's so important to hear this. It sounds like that, you know, like if someone's up there pulling the strings and judging you. You're a naughty girl. I'm going to pull the string on hell, you know, for you. No one's running this. This is what we hear this so strongly. That's our that's our experience of being Jewish or, or Catholic or Hindu or, or, or Muslim. This God is running it. There's nobody running us. This is the part that's so hard to, to, to take in because we just assume there's a boss running the show, you know, and we're going to get punished and rewarded. We think of it this way. There's nothing to do with it like that. It's a practical issue. So we have positive negative positive seeds and we have negative ones. The negative ones are left in the mind as a result of actions that we do based on it, anger, attachment, jealousy, low self-esteem, misery, blah, blah, blah. I mean, join the world. You know, we're very familiar with those. So we have to train ourselves to become familiar with impermanence throughout the life so we don't live in denial of death, which already prepares us to have a happy mind and, and accept that death is natural, which prepares us already to go through it in a more easygoing way. And then having you know and then also that it enables us to be peaceful at that time which is why it's crucial to help people in the time of death you know because most people do have fear unless you're a highly evolved yogi you're going to have fear and worry and concern so to have a loving kind person literally holding your hand through this process you couldn't give a better gift to anybody you know i mean i i think of ordinary examples you know when something goes wrong in your life the first thing you do is think of someone to talk to don't you when you're a little girl, you know, the first thing you do, if you have a good mother and father, you make a beeline for mummy, you know. Because straight away when something goes wrong, you call out for somebody or you, you want to speak to them. Like if you live in houses with husbands and wives and people, that's what you do. I mean, I live on my own, but I remember one time when I was in Kofan Monastery, I was going down the, about 100 steps down, you know, it's a very hilly, to visit my friend Annie Fran at Kofan. 
and I fell the last few steps and really hurt my back. And I screamed out, Fran, help me. Do you understand? The first thing we do is we reach out to somebody. Well, most people in these poor old whole people's homes drugged out of their brains in misery and fear in hospitals, on the streets, with no one to help. So it's the most precious gift you could give to anybody, you know, to be there, to make people just feel secure. Because uh, as soon as you run to mummy crying as if the whole world has collapsed, you know what she says? This is what I find so mind-blowing. She doesn't fix the problem. She just says, it's all right, darling. And you believe her. Suddenly you calm down. So just having, being there with, and that's why with your pets, the same, you know, instead of panicking, going to the vet, killing it, love your pet, give it, let it hear prayers, we're going to go into all this, right? But be there as a support. This is really the gift that you give to people. As I mean, as open as education we all need, you know, because we're all going to die. So this enables a person to be to be to be sort of relatively peaceful and calm at the time of death, and that enables virtuous karmic seeds to be triggered, which are exactly what you need just to get another human body. That's it. It's a very, it's a technical issue, not a moralistic one. You know, well you must die peacefully, otherwise what? It's practical. I mean, if you don't learn to drive the car when you're on the freeway, you have a panic attack. It'll just keep you calm when you know what to do. Same here. So the way, so roughly just to talk about karma a little bit for a start, just to, you know, this is the framework. We want the virtuous karmic seeds to be available and to be triggered at the time of death. Because it's literally, I mean, in the process of death, we'll go through it. It's, it's sort of, by the time the death process starts, this way they've described it in the Vajrayana, it's described in terms of eight stages, okay? I'll say this now, then we'll go into karma. And so when you become familiar with this, you can learn to see, it, you can learn by seeing. Once you're familiar with it, you can see when the process starts, unless you're not familiar. If you're not familiar, it's hard to know. But it, it's typically, the way Lama Zobit does it in the book, it's typically it takes about two hours from the time the process starts until you stop breathing. But it can be very quick or it can take much longer. It can take days, you know. I always remember when Steve Jobs died. I was a fan of Steve Jobs. I remember his um, sister they were separated as little children. They were given away, you know, at birth. And they met later on in life. And she wrote about going that day because he had cancer or something. And he knew he was dying. And anybody who read about it, he talked a lot about it. He was really, you could see he was really in touch with impermanence, you know. And I remember um, uh, he was, she, she, she rang that day and the wife or something said, you better come. He's, you know, he's going to, he looks like it's close. So she got there and he's skinny as a rake with his cancer and he's on the bed and his two daughters were there or something. And he, I remember she said he was packed, ready to go. Oh, that was so nice. Something like that. And so this, this is the part I remember. Um, let's just pretend you're Steve and I'm the sister and I'm out close and his two daughters are in front of him and I can see the back of their head and they're looking at their daddy and she can see Steve's face. And she said, he, no, this is me paraphrasing, that he was looking with such love at his daughters begging them to forgive him for leaving them, not like panicking, freaking out, clinging, you know, full of love. And then suddenly he looked up over their shoulder into the distance and he went, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. And then he died right there. He stopped breathing right there, you know. So this is, we've got to get to this. But what if a virtuous karmic seed is triggered when this process starts and it all happens before you stop breathing, at this point, that's what happened with him, and it happened very quickly. Then death is a very blissful experience. He looked like he was blissful. Death is a very blissful experience because a virtuous karmic seed is triggered, which then determines that you're either going to get a human life or like be born in a pure land. And we're going to go and discuss that, you know. So it's so that as you're you see as you're dying, you're going from the grosser level of consciousness to a more subtle level, and a more subtle level is it's like, you, it's, it's more powerful. It's like you're moving towards sleep or you're like in a dream when your mind is much more powerful and you can see other, you can, your mind is more subtle. People, you know, when you've got a sense of other people's experiences, it's almost like clairvoyance. Then you see a good life coming. So you, your life is blissful. A friend of mine fell off the roof at Vajrapani Institute. Um, this is 40 years ago. And he died in his wife's arms and she said he was radiant. So that in those cases, you can that proves in this perspective that a virtuous karmic seed was triggered because it happens about before you stop breathing. The karmic seed that is the one that will determine your next life. So if you die freaked out, 
then death will be a very terrifying experience because like you see your future life coming and it can be horrific that's how they talk and again don't think it's punishment no one's there running this it's just natural i remember a friend of mine a nun in queensland she sat she used to sit with the dying and she talked about one fellow and lama zoba said he had the same experience as somebody who um suddenly he said he she'd never seen anything like it. he became like this absolutely beyond terrified and he became like a demon himself his eyes turned red his eyes were back up in the, in the in the back of his head he was screaming in horror like he was seeing this shocking like what people say hallucinating he's seeing a, a you know a, a future suffering rebirth like hell or something then he quietened down and he died peacefully and then she checked with her lama he said yeah probably he it was heading towards a negative rebirth but then he didn't die yet and then he, clean, he purified some karma and then he got a good rebirth but the way you die the way it's vivid it's vividly clear it's hard to know if you're in a coma because you can't see but people often say people die very peacefully well if they're in a coma you don't know if they're peaceful but often even if they're in a coma or if they're you know, half asleep from drugs they're tossing and turning and, and really distressed. So you can tell the difference, you know. So this is the, so it's crucial that the person is there in a good situation, conducive. I mean, this is one of the series, the series of advices Rameshay gives, you know. The room needs to be really beautiful. And it's, 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 it's only, the, only the people who are going to be really supportive should be in the room. Don't have the pets in the room because so much attachment comes. You've got to really learn to help the person not be attached. And that's a very hard one for us in the West because we confuse attachment with love, you know. Because attachment is the worst way to die. It's kind of, you fling, you cling to things, you freak out, you don't want to die, you know, you don't let go. It's like a worst way to die. <clears throat> so the necessary thing is for virtue for the person to be peaceful and virtuous. This is the most important point. This is why you need to help people, your dog or whatever, you know. And there's so many stories about pets. Yeah. You know, you go to your vet, and I'm not being rude because dear vets have a hard job these days. They're killing animals all the time. And now it's considered really kind and you're considered cruel if you don't kill your pet when they're suffering, you understand? But I mean, at least twice now, two friends of mine, both kind of Buddhist, and they've got these dogs, and they've got, and the vet in, in both cases recommends they, you know, put them down, kill them, whatever words we use, put them to sleep or something, but call killing, it's okay. And they decided they wouldn't, you know, so that instead they just, they played, this is something we're going to talk about, but one of the most powerful things, especially when your mind is getting closer to death, or if you're in a coma, or if you're in a dream even, your mind can't, you can't see things, your eyes are closed, but your, your, your subtler mind, you can be aware of things, you know. People have this in their dreams, in a coma, in, in, all those people on the operating table like I discussed. This is your subtle mind and you can be vividly aware, aware of things. <clears throat> especially the, especially this like, that, that one I talked about, my friend Judy, who, who could hear my voice vividly. She was totally in a coma, you know. So with, with, and so one of the common, these two friends with their dogs, they decided just to play mantras. So mantras are very powerful because it's, 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 they're very peaceful sounds and the dogs don't know what's going on, but it, it can, it can focus their mind. The same with your old grandma, you know, she's half in and out of coma and it's just this very quiet, very subtle sound, it can be very quiet, but can be incredibly peaceful and can energize their mind, calm their mind, focus their mind. And of course, from the Buddhist perspective, it, it, it invites the holy beings to be there. It invites the Buddhas to be there, to protect and guide. And so these, both these animals lived longer than they were expected and were very peaceful and died very peaceful, relaxed deaths, you know. Just example, just saying, so many stories like this. So the key is the time of death. Okay, I'll go through the death process roughly now, and then we'll go back to how karma works. Very roughly. We'll go to more detail later. But roughly it's described in terms of eight stages. And basically it's, it's this deconstruction of the various components that make up a person. And this is not according to neuroscience, obviously. You know, it's according to this Vajrayana system, which is the same system as the, the Tibetan medical system. It's similar to the Ayurvedic one. It's similar to the Chinese one, you know, about the meridians or the, the chi, the winds, this kind of business, you know. So gradually this, this death process can, usually a couple of hours before you stop breathing, so that we've got, like I mentioned yesterday briefly, we've got gross consciousness, which is a sensory. And then that's inextricably linked, obviously, to the gross body, this bag of bones, you know. So the very first stage of death, 
they talk in terms of the four elements and the different kinds of states, the different sensory consciousnesses. So the first stage of death is when the earth element ceases. And one of the signs of that is your body becomes very heavy. You kind of, you feel like you even can you almost feel like you're sinking into the bed. And I remember when I was in India years ago and I had hepatitis and malaria in Delhi, in like a hundred degrees every day in this, Delhi is so intense in the summer, you know, and it's, unre it's relent unrelenting relenting unrelenting and i was and i was totally sick and curtis sent a room they said i was close to death i was in this house with no ac and i was totally hallucinating every day and nobody knew i had malaria because i had hepatitis i was bright yellow so i was having these dreadful fevers that kept going on and on and on and someone saw me and re recognized it was a malaria fever and i was i was literally close to death and i was hallucinating i had no idea what was going on and so anyway um what happened? Yeah, I had that experience. I remember my sister came all the way from Australia, halfway to Singapore to pick me up. And I knew I had to leave India. I'd die otherwise, you know. I was bright yellow. And for some reason, Air India let me fly bright yellow, whatever, luckily. And um, I remember I was in a hotel in Singapore. It was like utter heaven. I'll never forget as long as I live. This cool. It was just cool. It was incredible. But I remember I had that experience of my body sinking, you know. So that's one of the signs that you're beginning to die. The body, the earth element ceases. Clearly, I didn't die yet. So the earth element ceases, and there's a, then there's then there's a yes, eye consciousness begins to go. Now you know this experience. This is the same as when you go to sleep. Every time it's physiologically and psychologically the same, technically the same process that you go through every time you go to sleep. Every time you every time you go to sleep. So you know I'm there chatting away to Bob, and I'm really tired, and I'm still sitting upright, and he's chatting away, and my eyes are open. If I can't see him, your eyes kind of glaze over. You all know that experience. Do you understand? And that, so that's the eye, set, the eye consciousness beginning to cease. Your earth element becomes heavy. Your body becomes heavy. Then there's other things that occur in that spot, in that place as well, in that spot, in the first section, the first stage. Then the second stage, your ear consciousness goes. And that Bob tat, chatted away, and I missed the last 10 seconds. We all know that experience. You're in the teachings, and you're going to sleep, and Lama's over asked you a question. You, don't, you didn't hear it. You know, you're, you're on the way to sleep. You haven't fallen over yet. But you're on the way. So there's the elements are going, the senses are going. It's a gradual process. And by about the third stage, when your ear, eyes, what goes next? Your nose, consciousness, and your and your eyes, ear, nose, that's sense, isn't it? And then your um water element, fire element begins to go. At about this point is when the karmic seed that will determine your next life is triggered. Because you've got this bank vault of billions and billions of karmic seeds. I mean, again, as mad as it sounds to us, we've got if we've got beginningless lifetimes, you know, all the everything we ever think and do and say, nothing goes astray. It leaves karmic seeds. It leaves like seeds in your bank vault. Billions and trillions. And so, the one you want to be triggered, you want, you want. That's why you want to be peaceful. Is one of your virtuous karmic seeds, non-killing in particular, and in particular, non-killing karmic seed practice in the framework of living in vows of not killing. Very rich, delicious karmic seed. You want one of those to be triggered. And so, in our case, in our past death, we were going through the death process. We could have been a dog. We could have been a rat. You know, don't have to be a human. But for whatever reason, the karmic came together. Somehow, there was, a, there was a condition. Maybe, maybe we're hearing the next door neighbor playing a mantra with a rat in the kitchen. You know, who knows? Someone just saying. And then that triggered. But well, that was a catalyst to trigger one of your positive, your virtuous, non-killing karmic seeds from whatever life. Could have been a thousand lives ago. That was triggered. That then, at that point, programmed your mind. At my mind, let's say, to go to my present mother's human fallopian tube. It's not some car, it's not some accident. No one's running it. You know, it's a natural law. But to keep remember, we've got to think about karma in a very particular way. The way it's taught in all the texts is because it's talking to people who who take who have the view of reincarnation. We have to be unpack it in a different way. You know, try to get to hear how the how it's the logic of karma. You know. So about the, the third step, when you have a, by the third stage, when you haven't quite lost, lost the plot yet. The karmic seed that will determine, in our case, my particular rebirth to this particular mother is triggered. And it's very specific. I've got intense karmic history with that mother, you know. No one's running it. You create the cause. So in our case, one of those karmic seeds was triggered. Now, at the same time, the karmic seeds that will determine the other three ways that karma ripens in our lifetime, the tendencies in your mind, 
your experiences at the hands of others, basically. And the third one's called environmental karma. There's four ways that karma ripens. One is the fully ripened result. So in our case, it was a virtuous karmic seed of non-killing that was triggered that determined we got a human mother. Then, then all the other karmic seeds that will then determine our personality, our tendencies, our, 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 our habits, whether you're, you know, whether you're a psychopath or a saint, good at music or football or killing or loving, whatever, look at the human world. All those are your own karmic tendencies. These are triggered before you get anywhere near your new mother and father. They are not the cause of your being good at music or killing or loving, which is a shock for us in the Western view. They're already your karmic seeds that are now triggered that will fit with this body, this mind. Then the next karmic seeds that are triggered, they're called experiences similar to the cause. There's all the things, you know, we're very social, aren't we? We, we, we start what, with a mother, a father, siblings, aunties, uncles, people, neighbours, rats, cockroaches. We have very intense connection with sentient beings. And we know in this life they either harm us or they help us. There's hardly much difference. The third lot we have no connection with. So we have very intense history with sentient beings. So this, this is called experiences similar to the cause. So they, those karmic seeds are going to be triggered, ready to ripen. And the fourth lot, they're called environmental karma. So give an example. All, all actions that we ever do can have any of these four results. So if it's non, if say it's not killing, let's say it ripens as a fully ripened result that becomes a human birth. You get a human mummy. Never, then if it ripens as a tendency, you'll wake up in this life with no thought to kill. But to look at the human world, people. Most humans kill something. This is a tragedy. And the difference between those who wake up with no tendency to kill and those that have a tendency to kill is that those who have no tendency to kill, and there's very few, they've lived in vows of not killing, which is why vows are so powerful. We'll go into this. The third way you're killing, non-killing will ripen is you won't get killed and you won't die young. Look at the world. Most, so many people die young, get killed. You know, people die when they're people die when they're babies. People die when they're two. No medical reason. They just drop dead. We just put a question mark on it. Doesn't fit with our model, you know, because their karma run out. But that that fetus who came to my body when I got pregnant, right when I was twenty three, this person came to my womb. One, they had the karma to get a human body. That's the first one. But secondly, the third one, they also had the karma from past killing of me to get killed by me. So that was the experience similar to the cause of past not kill, of past killing. So they had the karma to not kill, they got a human body, the main one, but they had the karma of, from past killing to be aborted. So I'm sure you, if you did your research, I'm quite sure we'd find that there are more human beings who die before they're born than those who die after they're born. That means fetuses. That means abortions and miscarriages. I wouldn't be surprised because you become human from the second, first second of conception. So the, the fully ripened result of killing is you get born in the lower realms, animal, spirit or something. The second karmic result of killing would be you, have a, you wake up in this life with a tendency to kill. Kill the rats, kill the roaches. Most humans kill something. Most religions even say it's okay to kill. I'm just talking. We can see it. Third, people get killed and die young all the time. And four, environmental result of killing is you get sick. The physical world itself harms you. Pollution. I mean, what do you think COVID is? It's the, the collective karma of the entire world. But the physical world, including human beings, can, can har harm you. You kiss your grandmother and you die, you know. So there's four ways that karma ripens. Type of rebirth, tendency to keep doing it, having it happen to you, and the environmental results. So in our case, we got the human body. Miracle. We kind of won, you know, got won the lottery. It's not a lottery, but it's like that. So special. One of our virtuous karmic seeds of non-killing was triggered, programmed already before we even stopped breathing in the past life to go to our mother and father. And then they're not they don't know we're coming. They might not even have met each other yet. But karma's already planned, you know, due to past history with each other. <laughs> And then the other karmic seeds are there to, to produce the person you become and, and to produce all your experiences. They're not random. They don't happen unfairly. They're not created by somebody else. All past actions, our own part. We are our own creators, as Holiness says. You know, you can say karma's like that. All this is happening before you stop breathing, people, in the past life. So then because we got a human body, our death would have been relatively peaceful. 
and then you go through this. So then the fourth stage of, of this three or four stages, already these karmic seeds are triggered. The fourth one is you stop breathing. The breath stops finally. Earth, air, earth, fire, all the four elements stop, and then the air stops. The breath stops. Well, that's what's called death in the modern world, but it's not death for this view. This is just your gross consciousness has ceased. Then you go through these other stages, four more stages. We'll go into more detail later. But it can be up to three days before the subtle consciousness, because you've got subtle consciousness, which is all your mental states that are more subtle, are still there, but you know, it, there's no evidence of them. And then you even and then that gradually ceases, gets subtle, it deconstruct, 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 till you get to the eighth stage, and that's called very subtle consciousness. So the subtle level of the physical is is this subtle nervous system we have. It's sort of variations of the Chinese system, the, the Indian one, you know, 74,000 subtle channels. And the coursing through those channels, all the different wind energies. I mean, the Tibetan doctors study this for years, you know, and then inextricably linked to all those wind energies are your different states of mind. They're utterly linked. They say the mind rides on the winds. So all this is happening with the fourth, fifth, the fifth, sixth, and seventh stages, ever more subtle, ever more subtle, until eventually all that's left is your very subtle consciousness or the clear light consciousness, and this very subtle wind energy, inextricably linked. This is like the very subtle body and very subtle mind, they call it. And that can and that's there, and you can be just like up to three days. You're not aware of it. The great, but this is what the great yogis have been waiting for. They've spent their lives through their meditations, in a sense, replicating this process. So they're super familiar with it. They're able to go to this subtle level of mind with complete concentration. And that, and they grab the opportunity of this very subtle wind and very subtle mind at the time of death, the clear light mind. And it's like the microscope of your mind. And they're ready for that. And this is the most powerful level of mind the most potent, the most capable. And because they practice all their life, then they're able to utilize that to remove all the obstacles in Asia to become enlightened. And they can sit there for meditating for days, hours, days, weeks, or even months sometimes. Many, many examples like that. Lama Yeshi was meditating for five days. Many Lamas meditate for longer because they're in control of this process. For most of us, we're not in control, you know, but at least we can be kind of virtuous and be kind of relatively ready for it. But our mind will just sit there for three days, up to three days, not conscious. And then the, it, then the very subtle mind, in extremely linked with that very subtle wind, will leave the body. And that's that's when death is, up to three days later. This is why in the in the chapter there's a chapter um, in this in part four I think here where what to do at the time of death. So you know there's different scenarios. What to do if your loved one dies at home? What to do if your loved one dies in hospital? What to do if your loved one dies suddenly? What to do if your loved one gives their organs? So this organ one, let me say, you know, um, says the hospital should be careful because obviously the Buddhist perspective, this perspective, particularly the Vajrayana, at the time of death, when the breath stops, is not death. That's just the gross consciousness ceasing. And I gave that example, didn't I, about that book? Yeah. I talked about that, didn't yeah. I? Yeah, exactly. So you really have to be careful, you know. So the only reason, I mean, this is why about the organ business, I mean, I've decided somewhere I think I left on my license maybe in Australia take my organs, but they, what do they do with an old lady's organs? They don't want them, do they? What what, is that, what old lady's organs do they like? The eyes, maybe. The eyes. Okay. Anyway, I should tell him. I mean, now it's very naughty. I mean, this man in this book, he's a he's a doctor, and he's a, he's a medical journalist in, the, in this country. He was very cynical about the, the profession. He doesn't doubt the kindness, but very cynical about the way they manipulate. It's very elitist. Put, I mean, even in Europe now, the default law they've all forced it, is that you give your organs. You, you mightn't even know, but that's the law now. You have to consciously say, don't take my organs. It's very wicked, you know, very naughty. Huh? But if you're not technically dead for three days, you're dead. this bothers me. In that book, they said people suffer. That's what I was saying. Yeah, and no, also, not suffer. No, no, I didn't say it. What, what are you saying? Some people, if they, they question nurses wouldn't do it anymore because they felt that the people had pain. But... No, you see, okay, 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 so listen, it, it, okay, okay, no, no, okay, so listen, this is the point about understanding the different levels of consciousness. Yeah. The grosser level is when your senses have ceased. So you can't have pain, not physical pain, because your senses aren't working. So in other words, that example of that woman for whom the heartbeat on the monitor went from 100 to 200, she, she can't feel anything because she's, she's, she, her senses have ceased. 
So you could, you know, she's not going to feel it, but because her subtle mind is is aware, she's having like an outer body experience. Oh. That's the point. She's observing and she's panicking because what are they doing? Cutting my body? I'm not dead yet. That's the point. But so indeed, I mean, that's the point about the nurses, and that's you know, it's, it's a good because if you get people. Yeah, they say that you can feel sometimes the presence of people, that kind of thing. But but the real, the only reason it's 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 got to be careful about organs is an example like that. I mean, most people when they have an operation don't have an out of body experience, right? And most people when they die also won't. So it'll be okay. But for those, that's when it's a danger. Because what and why it's dangerous is only because there she is the karmic seed had already been triggered for her probably to get a good life where she died peacefully and she and ramazoba praises people who with compassion want to give their organs but there she is on the operating table about to have a body cut with a circular saw and she must be having an outer body experience with her subtle mind so then that she freaks out that can change the karma that's the only reason it's difficult because the karma can then change to negative karma and get a suffering rebirth do you see my point I do. you do that's the reason yeah. That's the reason, the only reason, it's a technical point, not some moralistic thing. So, um, okay, so we'll go to the process more, more, more later, tomorrow probably. Today's what, Friday or Thursday? Thursday. Thursday, we've still got Friday, okay, fine. Can I ask you a quick question? Yep, sure, darling. Hey, hi, I wanted to ask, what's the name of this book you're referring to about the- How to Face Death Without Fear. Oh, okay. So this one has the the information about the the organs and stuff. Is that all of this? All of this that I'm talking uh -oh. about. Oh no, uh -huh. sorry, sorry, sorry. No. Well, yes. There's a book by Lama. This book I'm describing here, but the book that I quoted by this medical journalist is okay. called The Undead. Yeah. The Undead oh, by okay. Nick Teresi, T E R E S I, the medical oh. journalist. Discuss all you. the problems. Yeah, that one. Undead. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. So anyway, um, so let's just go back then to the the first stages. Rimache talks a lot about how important it is to make the condition, the room, um, the room to be really conducive. One of the things is we, you know, sick sick rooms can be almost like the worst room in the possible, cluttered and noisy and dark and miserable. You know, a friend of ours, a nun. Trisha, who ran our centre in Bodhgaya, I mean, she's the same age as me, so, you know, I'm waiting for my time to come too. We were both born in the year of the monkey, 1944. But maybe eight years ago now, she got cancer. She was in Australia visiting family. And she got this virulent cancer, and they said she's going to be dead in a couple of months. So she contacted Lama Zopi. He said, yeah, there's no point in doing anything. You might as well just get ready for death. So she, she stayed, she found a place that was beautiful, up in the mountains, with beautiful views, you know, beautiful views, incredibly peaceful. Because the fact is, you've still got senses. And because your mind's stressed, we all know if you're in a dark room and ugly and noisy, it's even more distressing. So you give, you really should make the place beautiful, as conducive as possible for the sick person. Because we've still got senses. So make it peaceful. There shouldn't be noises. People shouldn't be walking in and out. The things that, you know, you think about the things that the person sees should be something useful for them you know there's a friend of mine who was a buddhist a student of Lama Zopa, when she was in bed the whole time she had pictures on the wall she had things on the ceiling so when she opened her eyes she could see her guru you know if you've got your christian your mummy's a christian have god there have the saints there everything you see and hear should be conducive for you to be peaceful remind you of what you want to think about but if you open your eyes and there's clutter and smelly old dirty flowers and machines how depressing you know and also because as you're getting sicker, you're getting closer to your subtle mind, so you're much more sensitive. You're incredibly sensitive to the tiniest sounds. That's even when you learn to meditate. Yeah. I think a friend of mine, I told you, Venerable Renee, you know, he said he, in this particular place where he went to meditate, a beautiful place up in, in the mountains in Spain, Lama's ascent, the center there, as you get more subtle, as your mind gets more subtle, meaning away from the grosser level of sensory and conceptual, you become incredibly sensitive. He said to the tiniest shift in the wind, it could be very distressing for your mind, unless you're a highly evolved meditator. It's the same when you're sick. You become more sensitive. So it should be incredibly peaceful, really nice sounding, nice looking. The sound should only be, I mean, like I said, the Buddhist, only the sounds of Dharma, the sounds of mantra, the sounds of teachings. It should be really 
beautiful for this person. We often don't think like that, especially if they're in a coma. We think, oh, well, they're in a coma. But they still you can be very conscious, you know, and people are chatting and talking about you and shouting about the will and you're, in, you're there. I mean, it's so distressing, you know. It should be so important to make the place beautiful. Of course, this, is, this of course, is if you're in charge. I mean, if you're only, if you're the sixth sister down and, everybody, and they're, everyone else is running the show, you can't do much, you know. It's only if you're in charge that you can run, you know, you can decide all these things. You understand my point? Where's my book? I downloaded it. Where is it? Here it is. Okay. So let's go to some of the chapters. Yes, helping others at the time death is a big responsibility. Create a conducive environment for peaceful death. There's chapters. And then Rinpoche, all his practices, like chapter 13, chapter 14, the practices, what to see and touch, what to think about, what to hear, what to meditate on, what to do to purify negative karma, what to do the hours before death. So many different practices, so many things. And that means you've got to know your, you've got to know who the person is. You've got to know your mummy, what she likes and doesn't like. I mean, your mummy might be a communist. Don't talk about Jesus to her, for God's sake. You know, maybe she hates Buddha. You don't talk about Buddha. You just be reasonable to your mummy, you know, you, you do what she wants. If she loves God, talk about God to her. Help her. What's this one? 69. I'll just have to find the pages. Can't find. Okay. 59. 69. Okay. So, page, so well, before that, death is what the yogis have been waiting for. I'll tell you about that later. It's a big responsibility, Rinpoche says, you know. So Rinpoche says that the people who help, who give advice and support, and especially the one who speaks the name, okay, there's one of the practices that all the lamas do. When the person dies, you shout the name of their guru in their ear. That's very hilarious, isn't it? If they love Jesus, you probably do the same. In order to ensure that attachment doesn't arise in your loved one's mind, especially when the time of death is close. Rinpoche says it's best not to allow anyone for whom you have strong attachment to be in their presence. You shouldn't even mention their name. I mean, this sounds very cruel to us, but it means we have to understand the, the, the suffering of attachment, and we don't really in our culture. Attachment is when, the mind, when there's attachment, the mind is grasping and tight and not happy, and that's exactly the opposite of what you want, you know. So I remember, yeah, I mean, this, I remember one of the common things you hear about people, oh, she won't let go, they say, you know. So if you're sitting around the bed talking and chatting to grandma, she, it, it, you know, it's, it's, in, it's like feeding her attachment. So it's almost like a, keeping her alive when she's actually ready for death, you know. I remember this one example of one woman I sat with in California. She was so anxious and so concerned and so fearful. She liked Lama Yeshi. And I remember... When, when in the, she was on her own. People come and do rosters and take care of her and have the television on the whole time, you know. People think, oh, well, that's distracting. But it, it's as if it's good, you know. But just it, it energizes. The mind goes to whatever's there. So if it's peaceful, the mind is quiet. If there's television noises and things and things, your mind rushes out to it and it's disturbing, it's distressing, you know. So at one point she said she liked Lama Yeshi and I left a video or the old-fashioned one with a tape to put into the, to, to, into the television for the people. She wanted to hear it. So then apparently the television broke, so they couldn't even have the television on. Well, she died in an hour because mm. she was able to calm down. Nothing, nothing was agitating her, you know. So it's really to watch for that. Attachment is when the mind is distressed, holding on to things, um, people, things, experiences. And this is what happens all the time in the old people's home. They have a television loud, you know, a lot of noise and as if it's somehow distracting them. It's just distressing. So pets, it sounds very shocking to us. We're so attached to our pets. We think it's love. This is incredible attachment. I mean, one of the key things they will say is keep the pets away because it can distress the person's mind, you know. And the people, you should be really, if you're in control, you know, people are going to tell, talk and shout and cry. It's the worst thing you could possibly do for the loved one. The worst. You can't force, but you have to be very wise. You know, everything, in other words, all the decisions you make should be for the benefit of the dying person. That's the key point, you know. So important. 
So, and then creating a conducive environment. Just, you know, if there's a Buddhist, you have really lovely things you have, so they can see and hear. No tobacco. I mean, all the lamas say that tobacco is really heavy, so don't have it, let them have it smoke in. No pets, animal skins, a calm and peaceful environment. Then there's different practices. I mean, you know, Rumi is into all of these practices, things even just to see, to see images. It leaves an imprint in your mind. You know, to see, see holy images, to see the statues, to see the, you know, holy objects, to touch, all these things. Rumi Shay likes all these practices. You have mantras on the body, bless, you know, things like that. What to think about. I mean, this is where if the person is still talking and they're not totally unconscious. You'd be very, don't just rabbit on about nothing, you know. You, everything you should be helping the person without being overtly kind of like being like a policeman to keep, be calm, but to be virtuous. And virtuous means to, for their mind to feel loving, for their mind to feel compassionate, for their mind to feel positive, or if they, if they, if they like God, to have faith in God, which calms them. It's to help their mind stay stable and calm. That's your key responsibility. So like say like your mummy, you know she's a Christian, but she hasn't been to mass lately and she's anxious and worried and tossing and turning. You don't say to her, oh, think of God, mummy. You tell her, mummy, I've been thinking about God lately. You know, I think God loves us. God loves you. Or you can talk about heaven. I mean, it's very practical. Lama Sopa says this is a way of using attachment at the time of death. Because one of the functions of attachment, many, there's many, one is to think, look into the past all the time. One is to cling onto what you've got. And that's the one that's so intense at death. You're clinging desperately, unable to, unbear, unbearable to thought of not being you, you know, it's so primordial. So one skillful thing is if your mother's a Christian, you talk about heaven so she can look forward to heaven. So another way that attachment functions is to look forward to something. We live in that. You can use that skillfully because then they'll let go of attachment to this and they'll relax, you know. So it's very wise to use attachment. So if they're a Buddhist, you talk about you know, the Buddhist things. You do what's appropriate for the person, you know. Distracted by your example of Steve Jobs dying, looking lovingly. Yeah, and his, and his daughters, yeah. I suspect you quoted that. No, I, that's my point, I think. Okay. What I'm deducing, she didn't say like that. But the way she described it, it sounded to me, because if you're attached, you're clinging, you're crying, you're looking distressed, I don't want to leave you, it's not happy. Mm -hmm. it's very, it's, you, when it's mainly attachment, it's really not happy. Can you see what I'm saying? She said she was looking, he was looking with such love into their eyes and apologizing to them for leaving them, not crying with you. I mean, when you're attached to somebody, you can't bear to leave them. You, you cling to them, you hold on to them, and, it's, and you, look at their, you look at a person's eyes. I mean, when we're seeing romantic movies, it's not, it's not happiness, but we love it. And these two people looking loving at each other, but it's like demented. They're not looking happy. They're kind of weeping as if it's beautiful, you know. That's very, very different. That was only, my, she didn't say it like that, but she said it looked very lovingly at them. So I was deducing that. Attachment, that's my point. Attachment and love are very, very different. Do you see my point? Yeah. What to hear? I mean, this is the one about, you see, this, the hearing one is more subtle. It's obvious. Eyes are the first one to go. Hearing is the second. So, you know, this is one about people in comas, people in dreams, people even looking like they're dead can be hearing things. So that's why it's so important for, to, for the room to be peaceful. And no sounds except for, let's say they're Buddhist or Christian, no sounds, or even if they're not, just having quiet, quiet mantras playing, very quiet. So important. Sound is much more subtle. Like my friend in a deep coma, I told you that one, Judy. The only thing she could remember weeks in a deep coma was his voice. Judy, Song Tsa Ken Se Rimiche is praying for you, you know. That's, you can't argue with that. In dreams, I mean, people such common to have what they call lucid dreaming. I think isn't it? I remember a retreat I did, my very first retreat years ago, three months. I remember a certain period, crystal clear. I'd, we'd have our nap. It was a rainy season, so we always in India you have a nap at lunchtime. I remember this period, crystal clear dreams, as if I was awake. I didn't see things, but I could hear things. I was asleep, and it was crystal clear dreams. That's your subtle consciousness. So people in coma, people looking like they're dead, people asleep, 
that can be many people can be very very aware so that's why it's so important not to have raging on rubbish sounds and to have pure holy sounds because they can really penetrate you know like for those dogs a friend of mine had all her little guinea pigs oh. she had prayers playing the whole time for little guinea pigs you know and they're little sensitive creatures as well all the animals it can benefit their minds in their sleep and everything and calm them you understand people sound Ravina, yeah i used your book when my mother was dying yeah and um about three months before she died she was attacked i'm the fourth kid and a couple more and she was so attached i remember her saying at christmas i crying i love you so much i don't want to leave that's right of course exactly of course but then a month later i went down and and i had a peaceful one-on-one -on -one with her yes six days later i got a call that she was dying it was yes in virginia yes and i knew that of the six of us she was the most attached what to you me. Were. so i decided not to go because she was so attached to me so and you think that was good a, she had a very peaceful death okay that's good and good. all of us felt her presence when okay she died. i understand that's interesting isn't it they've got to be got to know what's best isn't it for the person that's a really good point isn't it that's good thank you then Rishay, of course, I've got these lists of mantras to do. I mean, one of the longest chapters it took me was all these mantras. So many mantras. Rishay is famous for finding mantras that nobody else has heard of. He loves his mantras. All kinds. And names of different Buddhas, all kinds of mantras and names and things. Then lots of meditations to do, guiding people. There's so many things. And of all these 87 practices, Rishay says, you want to choose one, choose the medicine Buddha. Just medicine Buddha mantra. That's it. You can just, you know, you just, it's, yeah. This is it's right. Okay, many, many meditations you can do, all according to the person's capacity. Of course, these are mostly Buddhist, but you can adjust, you know. Many, many practices. Then all these different purification practices you can read for the person. But the key one is the environment to be peaceful, to be, be that's exactly the point you made, to be really understand the dream, a person when they're loving and a person when they're attached. It's attachment, it's stress, stressful. You can't bear not being with the object, you know. I think it's Steve, Steve Jobs, he must he was preparing for a couple of years because he, he, he'd read the words he was saying. He was really quite in touch with impermanence and would talk about it and the value of life and not to waste life, that kind of thing. So it's really part of his practice, it seemed, you know. And then, of course, there's all these things when the, when the death is getting closer. It, and, of course, you can't tell. I mean, with Steve Jobs, he died, boom, just like that, you know, very quick. People can be more more quiet, more slow, more gradual, you know. So any questions so far, people, on what I've said so far? Any questions, anybody? Yes. I have a question that's been bothering me for a long time. Go on and good. Get my head around it. Yeah. If you look at cause and effect, you know, on this world, the, the saying is like if you're born in a God realm. If you're born in a God realm. Probably you'll wind up in a hell realm. So then? It doesn't make sense to me if you built up inordinate amount All that of time virtue. cultivating good habits. I understand. Body no, I know. Don't just say, "Well, I got to hit the pipe." No, I know, I know, I know. Okay, I think the point there is there's this one, this, and I mean that's how they talk about it. And when we first hear it, it always sounds very shocking. So let's analyze what it means, okay? Okay. Just take a human life. You know, some humans you can see have immense, immense wealth isn't it beauty some people have all of them together beautiful houses enormous wealth power success you've seen that right so that's the fruit of virtue you can't have a single cent if you haven't got generosity karma you can't have beauty if you haven't been peaceful in a past life you can't have friends and a good reputation if you haven't been kind and humble with people all that's the fruit of past karma you, you agree with that so it ripens in this life but what do you do with it? Because you've got attachment, I have to swear now, you piss it down the toilet. You misuse it, you grasp at it, you think you're important, you become arrogant, so you completely destroy all these fruits of virtue and become enormously attached to them and poison them and thus create negative karma and when it all runs out, down to the lower realms. That's the point. It's not a question of, you know, you shouldn't, shouldn't happen. That's the tragedy of it. That's the point. Can you not hear that? That's the point. So if you can be born in this life with good things and have renunciation and have generosity and humility, wow, you've hit the jackpot. 
You see what I'm saying? So the, the God room is just an example of a 10 billion times more joy. That's all. The fruit of virtue. But it's not, it, it, you're not utilizing, it hasn't, it hasn't got compassion and virtue and emptiness and, and body feet in the mix. That's the point. And we're communicating. Does that answer your question? 99%. You would think, though, if you could live for three eons, it would almost be inevitable that you would develop the wisdom no, to because, get that. No, that's the point. It's because of the attachment. That's the whole teaching, because the attachment of those beings is so incredible that you can't have any, there's not an atom of space for any wisdom, which is why it's better to have a human birth. That's the point. That's the teaching of it, because attachment is so, because the joy is so tremendous and the attachment to it is also there. There's no virtue there. There's no virtue there. It's the result of virtue. But unless you practice other virtue and get renunciation, when you get it, you just, you're like, you're sucked into it. You see my point? Yeah. Which is the suffering of every, every human, you know? Just at a less level, that's all. This is why hearing about the 12 links and the process of what of how karma ripens is, is, is very powerful, you know. So there's 12 links. Um, there's always this example I use of this little fisherman. It's a story I tell a million times, but I always can't, I can't never get a better story. It's such an example. He was a little boy. He got a human life, right? And his mother, I met her at Copan, and she was, came to my room in tears because her boy had died at the age of 29, five years before. And he'd been, a, he'd been a fisherman all his life. He died scuba diving. And she, of course, thought at the time he died doing what he loved and she was sad, getting over the grief. And now suddenly she hears about karma and killing and lower realms. She's kind of shocked and in tears. Where was he born, you know, because he spent it. So what happened is this is how karma works, roughly. I mean, it's more intense than this. It's more detailed, so complicated, the details, but it's all there. But let's give an example. So like there's four ways of karma ripens, okay? So here is this boy who got a human body due to past non-killing. There's four tracks of karma, four bank bogs, if you like. So one of his virtuous karmic seeds from past non-killing was triggered at the time of his past death. And he got a human mummy. So now the other three ways that karma ripens are then the tendencies in that human mind. And he happened to, he was a kind boy, he was generous, but he had a tendency to kill. And look at humans. Most humans kill something. Most humans wake up in this life, know their mother doesn't teach them, with a tendency to kill. And it's so normal. We just consider it's normal behavior. Kill the roaches, kill the rats, kill the humans, kill the dogs. Okay, humans, we get a bit nervous. Dogs, we get nervous. But rats and cockroaches, wow, you're a saint to be killer pack, you know, because we, we don't like them. So we can see that most humans kill something. It's normal. So we just think it's a normal thing. I mean, most most religions, with respect, you know, I was taught as a Catholic that God made animals for our benefit. They don't have souls. He made them just for us so we could eat them and have them, you know. I mean, I'm just telling you the teaching. I'm not criticizing. So the, the tendency to kill. So from the Buddhist perspective, the tendencies you wake up in this life with are the, the, the main habits that you have, you know. So most people kill. So this boy had a tendency to kill. He also had many good virtues. He was kind, loving, generous, ethical in other ways. He didn't try to kill his mother. But he had a tendency to kill fish. Then the third karma is the result of killing is you die young. And in his case, he died young, age of 29. But, the, but, but he had other good experiences. People thought he was a nice boy. He had a good reputation. So lots of good karma. But he had this tendency to kill. So what's the, what's the logic of that? Well, there's another boy. I always use the example. A Buddhist, the son of a Buddhist friend of mine. She was taking the lice out of his head when he's a little boy, a wee boy, three years old. And he, in his case, I mean, I'm going to tell the fisherman in a minute. This little boy, he was in tears of compassion. Mummy, mummy, don't hurt them. It's their home. Leave them alone. Now, she didn't have time to teach him this. What's that tendency from? So not only did he have a human body as a result of non-killing, the fully ripened result, but he had a tendency not to kill. And what's that from is from practicing past non-killing and living in vows of non-killing. 
You program your mind strongly. That's why vows are so potent. Vows psychologically are so powerful. Because with a vow, you sit there and you say, from now until the day I die, I will never kill. That's a deep karmic imprint to put into the mind. So the little boy who was the fisherman hadn't done that. He'd finished the bad karma from the past lives of being in the lower realms from past killing. He'd exhausted that karma. He gets a human body like a miracle, but he hasn't purified the tendency to kill. So he has the residual result to wake up in this human life and starts to kill again. So then he spent his life killing fish. Now this is the point of how it works. So there he is. He's a little boy. Someone takes him fishing. He hasn't thought of fishing until he meets it. And this is the 12 links. There's one called contact. You have to you make contact with the object, in this case fishing. The next millisecond, the next one that arises is called feeling. And you either have a happy feeling or an unhappy feeling. There's only two kinds. There's a neutral feeling. It's a very specific use of the word. A happy feeling or unhappy feeling. So in his case, the very millisecond after making contact with fishing, instantaneously extremely pleasing feeling. So you know what? That Feet upon contact and then feeling coming, that the intensity of the feeling, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, happy or suffering, is the intensity of the karma you created. So the intensity of his past killing karma equaled the intensity of his pleasure when making contact with killing. Can you hear that? Let me finish, let me finish, let me finish first. But keep your question. This is the total tragedy. One, one fellow I read is an Australian bloke, he's a journalist, and he wrote very nicely. So he, he wrote about fishing. He loved fishing. He said when he first went trout fishing, it was a cosmic experience, like a religious experience. That means he had intensely joyful, pleasant feelings. Look at people who torture. Look at people who have a tendency to torture. We don't know why they're that. We just think they're evil. From past karma, you know. So when you, and then think, one of the signs of attachment is you think of the object all the time. And because it triggers pleasant feelings, so what happens with the fisherman? He made contact with fishing. Next thing he kept oh. Who's talking? Do you want me to ask me a question? Are we okay? All right, I'll continue. The, the next link that comes, or, or in an in instant, is called attachment craving attachment so the intensity of the pleasant feeling equal to the intensity of his past karma to kill and then intense craving happens because and that amount of attachment because the pleasure is so strong the next millisecond is attachment to that pleasure which then creates a picture a divine picture of, of fishing and so of course he's now programmed to want to go back and fish again of course you do you just got pleasant feelings we just we're fortunate enough just to get you know to get attached to cake for god's sake we can't resist the cake. Can you imagine trying to resist killing when it gives you such pleasure? Can you imagine trying to resist torturing when it gives you so much pleasure? And the pleasure is equal to the intensity of the karma having done it. We're locked into samsara. This is how they talk about it. We're locked into this technology of samsara. It's just how it works. It's all just pro primordial, programmed. Are we communicating? So this fisherman, of course he's going to go back fishing. He found his purpose in life to fish, kill fish. And this is the tragedy. The killing, this is the worst thing about attachment. His mummy never liked going fishing, she, but she just tried to love her boy for who he was. And she went fishing with him one time. And so, of course, because she had no tendency to kill, because she had a compassion for the fish, when she went fishing, she saw the truth, which was suffering fish. But he, habit from having done it, deep groove in his mind from past killing, enormous pleasure from it and attachment which painted a divine picture he never saw suffering he is a kind intelligent man he could never see those fish suffering he saw fish flapping he's probably if, if, if they can't make sounds they don't squeal like pigs so i mean that there are the people who, who kill the kill who kill the um who kill the seals they bash their heads to death blood squirts he even sees the blood he sees the the the, the 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 seal wanting to get away, but this fellow being interviewed was really upset that all the animal rights people daring to criticise his culture. So he had the tendency to torture people. I mean, fishing is torture as well. So this is this is attachment. This is something of attachment. People who have attachment, they don't mean to harm, but because of past habit, intense pleasure. 
And so we all want pleasure, all we want is pleasure. So those people in the God realms and the humans who get pleasure, you're know, like in bliss, you're like having orgasms day and night. How can you possibly resist that? Are we communicating? Are we communicating? Yes. That's fascinating. I find a very interesting analysis, Buddhist analysis of things, you know. We all, you see, we're junkies of pleasure. All we want is good feelings. All we want is happiness. All we want is pleasure. All we want, pleasure means happy feelings. And that's all we want. So if we find something that triggers happy feelings, you're not going to question it. And if the world doesn't like it, you do it in secret. You understand? But the pedophiles have to sneak around. They can't do it in public. This torturer, my friend on in prison, Mitchell is a Buddhist. He's got a friend there, and I know the guy. He said, Rabina, he thinks of torture all the time. You know the fellow years ago called BTK? Remember him? Bind, torture, kill. For 20, 35 years, his totally secret life. He, got a, he built a big dungeon, and he was addicted to kidnapping people, always more than one. Then he would torture them, and he'd get incredible pleasure from seeing them suffer, and then he would kill them. Okay, you have to ask where this karma comes from. I'm sorry to be rude, but it's from the animal realm, people. I'm not being rude about animals. If we, you know, we look at animals and we think it's so wonderful and all these animals killing each other and screaming and fighting each other. We just call it natural, you know. Mm. It's because of habit. So you bring these habits with you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, darling, absolutely. Something if what? If you recognize something in yourself, like that. Yeah. Tendency, yes. You want to change, That's right. Okay, darling. This is the whole job. This is the whole thing, and this is why the Buddhist practice, the Buddhist teachings, it's very very sensible. We can't hear it in the beginning. It just sounds so boring. Given that we have these karmic tendencies, whatever they might, whether it's to eat too much cake or jump on little girls or torture your husband or whatever it might be, you know, we're too scared to even see them because we're so terrified of them. We don't want to know about them and we don't, we don't know where they came from. We get guilty and ashamed and freak out. The very first thing, the first level of practice in Buddhism, don't worry about your mind. It's too advanced. And so we look at the Lam Rim. The very first level, entry level, junior school, grade one, control the servants of your mind. At least don't do the torture. So my friend in prison, you know, the people on death row, they like this guy, but they're not going to let him torture them. So the poor guy thinks of torture all the time, but at least he can't do it, which means he's not completing the karma. So at least you can, first job is control your body and speech. Have discipline. That's why I live in vows. This is tremendously powerful practice. We don't kind of hear it in our culture. It just sounds like sort of punitive. But if the habit is so strong, we all know if you're trying to, you know, you want to give up, if you, you have to give up eating too much cake, not give up attachment to cake yet, give up eating too much cake. The first level of practice at least control the servants of the detachment, and that's the body and speech. This is a tremendously powerful approach, but we don't hear it that way. That's the very first level. If you can't control your hand going to the cake every minute, how can you ever give up attachment, which is more subtle, which is the mind that drives the hand? You've got to give up. Put the hand in the lap first. So that already it's a powerful practice to live in vows. Vows are about behavior. So just living in vows to not kill, not steal, not lie, not jump on the wrong partner, you know, live in those vows because they're in your mind 24 hours a day. They're so powerful. Already you have got a tremendous practice. Be happy with it because you're at least not creating the heavy duty future karmic seeds for the future suffering that will come from harming others. There's logic to it, you know, the stages of practice. Then, of course, you've got the luxury now to work on your mind because you've got space, and that's what you have to learn to do, learn to harness this crazy mind of ours, at least the first step, is you can't stop the thoughts because the habit is so strong, so we have to learn not to buy into it. It's very painful because we want to follow the craving. It's hard to resist craving. Craving is our worst suffering. It's hard even just a piece of cake. Can you imagine killing fish or torturing when it's your habit all day and night? It's almost impossible. We go mad. We can't cope. So this is the, one of the practices we have to learn. To, that's why all the purification practices, learning to change your mind, purify the habit. We have to learn to live with this. I mean, we all know people who are alcoholic. You say, I'm an, I'm, I'm an alcoholic and I won't drink for 24 hours. You've got to be like a hawk because the habits are strong. And we've got to see the benefit of it, not guilt. That's how we change, you know. And then what we've got to have long-term confidence in 
is every time you don't follow the habit, even though it's hard now, you're sowing powerful seeds where in the future it'll be easy. But we, we just don't have enough patience to think of the future. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're communicating. Good no. And then we, because we have crazy minds, and we've all got tendencies, we've got tendencies. People have the weirdest tendencies, but don't want to talk about it, too scared, you know? So we can't own it. We're scared, we feel guilty, we beat ourselves up. We have to be very clear, see the mind, know it's past karma, don't, and then don't give it power, but not to beat ourselves up, not to define ourselves in terms of it. That's the big part that's problematic, isn't it? Yeah. Just curious about one point. You said that sometimes people feel very panicky or terrified when they know they're about to die. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, um, do you think there's something inside of people, whether they're Buddhist or whether they're atheist, that you sort of sense that possibly you didn't do enough to send uh, your... I hear you. I mean, guilty. You mean feeling guilty and regret. Feeling guilty and regret and maybe a dread that something bad is about to happen to me because I didn't live a good life. No, I think that's very strong in all humans. I think, yes, a kind of a, you know, a shame. No, I think so. I think that's very strong. Well, I mean, well, depends on the person. You have to have some awareness. Yeah, I think that's very strong at the time of death when you realise, you. I mean, whether you believe in God or not or whatever it is, that, you know, you, you know you're now suddenly this thing is coming, you know. So you really do take stock. Your whole Everything you think about now is completely different. When you don't realise you're going to die, everything for everybody else is the future. We live in the future, but you know there's no future, so then you have to take stock. I think that's very common, absolutely. And have those regrets of the things you've done. That's why people do radical changes in the time of death, because there's nothing to lose now, you know. And that's why it's very good, in fact, to have this, to be aware and then try and, and then, and that's why it's so to help somebody, like your mummy, you know, there she is. She probably was a good mother, but she thinks of all, we all think of the bad things we did, especially when you're dying. She has all this regret and the shame and guilt. Tell her she's a good mother. Tell her, thank, just, Pour love into her. Let her hear positive thoughts. You're a good mother. You've done a good life. This is like nectar for people, you know. But it doesn't. It doesn't change their karma, though, right? I mean. No, know, but it can stop. It can help them be lighter and more virtuous and more yeah, peaceful. Just a, yeah. That can even help them have, you know, make 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 something useful of it. Because I mean, this is the whole point about purification. You know, Buddhist practice of purification which every day we should do, is you regret the things you've done wrong because you're, you're sick of the suffering. Then you have compassion for those you've harmed. Then you do a little practice of purify, and then you vow not to do again. So it's a very wholesome kind of psychological approach, you know, and you can help people do that. Because one of the biggest problems is, I know when my friends in prison, when I work with people in prison, they kill somebody. So, of course, as far as they're concerned, they're going to go to hell. They're a bad person. They're a murderer. The world hates them. And then you define yourself in that way, and you've got to become hopeless. I remember actually going to, when I go to Sydney, there's a friend of mine goes into prison there, and I always go to the sex offenders unit. You know, and half the time, I'm, some of them are probably heavy duty, but some of them are just, you know, because the laws are so strict everywhere, you know, didn't do that bad. But the world, I mean, I think more than murderers, people hate sex offenders, you know. So inevitably, you're going to be just defining yourself in those terms. I mean, I know it's like really powerful to think of that and, and to not define yourself and to not exaggerate your badness and don't define yourself in terms of those actions. But then there's always this opportunity to change ourselves. Our minds aren't set in stone. I mean, the, the, Buddha, the people I have in prison, they love the purification practice because it's saying there's no karma we can't change. It's very optimistic, you know. It's important. It's so important. Because we always exaggerate our badness. Unless, of course, you're really deluded and you and you just define you 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 know you're totally deluded. You can't you don't even have a, any sense of conscience. That's not uncommon. Mm. Time is at quarter past eight. Any questions, people, sweetie pies? Venerable Robina, I have a question. Hey, Sarah. It's Sarah. Um, my question is. Um, do you think that it's helpful if you recognize, um, like, an, if you recognize a negative action or behavior or even, you know, habit of thinking, if you recognize it on the spot and do just really quick, like, Om Vajrasattva Hum, just recite. Oh, this. 
like anything, the quicker you catch it, the better it is. It's obviously, isn't it? The I mean, the sooner, if you discover you put a seed in the ground that's a weed instead of a flower, the sooner you pull it out, the quicker, it, the better it is. Of course it is, darling. That's it's the just... whole point about it. But that's the whole point, Sarah, when knowing, um, forget about concentration like we talked yesterday, but having this yeah. conscious awareness of your thoughts and your mind, you're adjusting, or you're learning to adjust all the time. It's like when you first start to drive, it's really a struggle to adjust you, you but as you're driving, you're adjusting all the time because it's so habitual now. It's the same with your mind, sweetheart. Of course you do that. I mean, of okay. course you do that. Of course you do that. That's what practice is. And, and then I have another, another question if you, like I have a... Um, uh, nephews who I adore and they fish and hunt and everything and I just adore them oh, I'm not I keep adoring them. and uh I can't okay and just have compassion that they love fishing and hunting and you know I mean rather than teach them at this point um I, I, you know it's up to you and you know them and how much they it's up to you it's up to you how to be wise with them how old are they okay um 14 14. And I mean, are you close to them? Yes. And it's the fam it's, it's their family's culture, isn't it? It's very strong, probably in the family, yes. right? Family yeah, culture. I mean, it's, I mean it's, it's, you've got to be wise. So it's like if ever there's a co time to have a conversation, you can talk about suffering and just, you bring it up in a very natural way for them to think about. It's up to you, you know. But I mean, some fishermen, anyway, some people go out fishing and then put the fish back, don't they? But you can't do that with a bear, can you? You can't just shoot its toe and then let it go away again. You have to sort of got to shoot it properly, mm -hmm. don't you? It's a no good that way. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, it's up to you to know these boys and talk about them, say things that might be useful for their mind, just sort of passing comments and things, you know. Like in the, you might see an ant and you could show extra compassion to it or the little pussycat and animals suffer as well. Just drop little seeds in their mind. It's up to them if they have the karma to hear it, you know. Yeah. But love them for who they are. Don't be fundamentalist, you know. I remember it was very yeah. funny, my sister... One of my sisters, she can't stand ants, and she put them. In, she'd put them in the microwave to kill them, you know. Oh. And I remember she, I didn't tell her not to do it, but before she'd do it, I said, "Oh, wait a second, Julie, wait a second. And I blow mantras on them first, and then she'd kill them. So I mean, all I can do, isn't it? <laughs> before you kill them, Julie, hang on. You understand? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we have. Are we picking up karma by not? Picking up to are we picking up karma? Yeah. Say a different words. Are we accumulating karma by not saying things? So, for example. Okay, okay, okay. No, okay. This is a very good point. There's compassion, and then there's wisdom. Wisdom, and meaning in a simple sense, compassion is you see, let's say a person harming a dog. They say, so you have compassion for the dog, but you have compassion for the harmer because they're creating negative karma. So you have compassion. And then and then you have to check to see if there's anything that you could do or say that might be actually useful. But if this person is not interested in what you say and just tell you to bugger off and mind your own business, then you just it's no benefit. So you have to have the wisdom to know how to help. And often there's no way you can help. So you've got to have wisdom, not to come from your own panic of, oh, my God, they're killing, this is bad, and give them lectures. Do you understand? You've got to have wisdom to know, which is just meaning common sense. Do you understand? But if you just lazily can't be bothered doing anything, then, yeah, of course, that's not so good. But, you, I mean, we're not in, we can't change the world, but we can do what we can with compassion, not only for the dog, but for the person who's harming the dog. you understand my point? Yeah? You have to have wisdom. It's not easy sometimes. We, we just want to go give lectures, you know. If it doesn't help, what's the point? If it doesn't help, what's the point? You just wasted your time. Huh? So we wouldn't have, if I determined it's not, it's not going to help, it'll just make them even more angry. So just have compassion for the, the one who is dying and the one who is killing. And with that compassion, like, what would that look like? You know, in my mind, you say mantras for that? I mean, you do whatever you can. All we get ever is there's compassion. So compassion is the is seeing suffering. And then when it's strong compassion, it's what can I do to help? 
then then the wisdom then kicks in. Well, what is it I can do? But you've got to be realistic. Sometimes, I mean, if you can go to Russia tomorrow or to Ukraine tomorrow and stop the war, honey, child, go. The world is full of intense suffering every second and 99% of it, we can't do a thing. So our trouble is we either get angry and shout and yell or we put our head in the sand because we go crazy. So this is what the Bodhisattva path is. You see the suffering, you understand karma, you know why they're doing it because of past karma. You, it increases your compassion and that means then that it increases your wish, I must never give up continuing to practice so I can become a Buddha, so I can benefit others. You don't give up. It increases, it's grist for your mill to strengthen your compassion and your will to continue to practice. Otherwise you give up and die. Do you understand? And meanwhile, very often I also say too, when you see the world so terrible, so many bad things happening, and you can't go to Russia tomorrow or Ukraine tomorrow or wherever the suffering is, but do something right here in front of us. Help that one dog, help one ant. That can be good for them, but also gives us some confidence. That there's always something we can do, and one step at a time, you know. There's always something you can do. Do you understand? But the first practice before that is to learn about karma, and that's the basis of having compassion. And then that strengthens your wish to not harm others yourself and to abide by the laws of karma and purify your own mind. Then you have compassion, and then you do what you can. And as you progress spiritually, you keep getting literally more capable. Do you understand? Are we communicating? So one more yeah, question. go. Um, um, you, can see, you can see a tendency. Be louder, darling. You can see a tendency, uh, a, a bad tendency in someone else, and I know I have the bad tendency. Sure, in me. yeah. I feel like what, what you know, I'd be a hypocrite to try and influence something in them so I go my merry way. Okay, first okay. This is the business about like I was saying before, the stages of practice. There are stages and levels of practice. So what happens? I open my iPad and I read all my newspapers. I like to read you can tell I'm old. I don't go to social media, I read newspapers. I even buy subscriptions, you know. New York Times, Washington Post, Financial Times, New Yorker, Vogue, Vanity <laughs> Fair. I, mean, I, I read all about people. So I open up my papers and I read. And what were you reading about chaos and wars and dramas and, ma and maniac politicians? So how do I practice? First level, very first level, entry level junior school. You go. You you recognize. I, I like. I, let's say I um. You know, see Mr. Trump. As I say, yeah. you know. So the first thing we tend to do, oh my God, look at Mr. Trump, this, that, he's this, he's evil. He, we, all, we have this endless kind of analysis, which is criticism of the war, of the people. We end, end up being angry. Do you understand? So what good is that? So the first level of practice is I listen to Mr. Trump and I go, well, there's lying. I recognize lying. There's hubris. There's arrogance. There's anger. I recognize anger. I recognize hubris. So I, I use him as grist for my mill to help me see my mind and then I think, thank you for showing me how not to be. This is, it sounds corny, but it's profound because the entire world is an example of garbage people suffering, creating, causing suffering. Thank you for showing me. So it's your learning. That's first level of practice. Bring it back to yourself. The next level is have compassion for them. Because they're creating karmic to harm themselves and future other people. That's it. Wisdom and compassion right there. Meanwhile, keep practicing and zip the lip and stop criticizing everybody for being so holier than thou. We're all holier than thou, you know, as if we have done everybody on the planet's like that. But there's nothing in Mr. Trump or any psychopath, maybe it's not as bad, because they're all attachment, aversion, jealousy, anger, killing, stealing. I recognize that. Maybe I don't rape. Maybe I don't torture. But I recognize delusions, I recognize negative actions, and that links you and makes you feel connected as humans. And then you have compassion for them. And if you can't help them stop, go for it, baby. Do you understand? Then life's worthwhile. Then there's no fear, get courage, perseverance. Because we're all in the same boat. Yeah. Then, how do you think we're worried about it? Bit louder, darling. 
And what do you think when you hear this President Biden speak instead of Trump? What are your feelings there? It's the same as, oh, I'm just using him as an example. I'm, I mean, Mr. Trump has got good qualities. Everyone's got good qualities. I know it's the same thing, exactly the same. Everybody's the same. So whatever, whoever it is you see, whatever you see, whether it's good or bad, use him as an example. Everybody's the same. They've got their own trips, their own attachments, their own rubbish. You see both. And it's good to see fault, and you're good to see the psychopath. Well, I don't want to be like that. But, you know, not, oh, this monster, may he suffer in hell forever. Oh, my God, I don't want to be like that. Thank you for showing me. And then compassion. And do what we can, because everybody's the same. We're all the same in the same boat. Exactly. And that's really important to bring it back to ourself. We're not holier than thou. Even though I mightn't be a pedophile, I recognize attachment. Even though I mightn't be a monster killer, I might, you know, or a liar, I might say wrong words. So we link it to ourselves, and then you get a sense of, and you, and you th thank you for showing me how not to be, would be another way to put it. Thank you for showing me how not to be. So it's a learning rather than pointing fingers. Right. That's what I mean. You know. well, Do you understand? You point four in your own direction. Actually. Exactly, darling. You see it, and then you own it, and then you realize we're all in the same boat, and then we can have compassion and be steady, you know? Doesn't mean we can't have opinions and still vote for this one or that one. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. But all the extreme way we all go on, you know. Yeah. Yeah. What people? Anybody? What um, time? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, you you mentioned one of the kinds of karma in environmental. Environmental karma. Yeah. And uh, um, to me, some parts of it sounds this sounds deterministic. If that makes sense. That, in what sense do you mean that? that um, the karma that this person um, uh, or us as individuals has ripened and that has what? Um, or that creates the, the condition or the environment that we live in um, in in that way in that way I'm 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 thinking about I'm thinking about kind of like the the world that we live in and there's so much inequality that's right it, um, that for me for me it easy to fall into the trap of saying like this is just our car like this individual no we can so what that we mean when we say it like that mm -hmm. we're being very um kind of like like oh well nothing you can do about it just they can't we sit there very passive but that's bizarre it's like if you see if i mean all you say when what do you mean when you say oh it's karma if you if you've never if you see a weed in the garden your goal in the garden is to have flowers isn't it and herbs right and you see a weed it's sort of like saying, oh, well, that comes from a seed. Yeah, it does. Now pull it out. So at least all saying, oh, it's karma, is really just saying, it's as if you've never learned botany. You see a garden and you've never heard of botany. And now you're suddenly going, well, that's just botany. I can't believe, oh, it's botany. But then you have to practice botany. But we tend to leave it, oh, it's just botany, and leave it there fatalistically. That's bizarre. Mm -hmm. that's, that's sort of fundamentalist. It's kind of like nihilistic. It's because we're so not used to the idea that we've created the causes for our experiences that when we say it, we sort of set it in stone. But it's like saying, oh, now I understand. Oh, wow, that's botany. I can't believe it. The idea of karma being unchangeable. Well, yeah, that, the, the real learning from karma is that's the cause. Now what do I do about it? Mm -hmm. We forget that part. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And that's where you can see in India, not being rude about Indians, how the, the whole thing of the caste system became this entrenched view of and now it's set in stone. And it defines you. It's, it's, it's exaggerated. It's too, de it's too deterministic, exactly as you said. It's a mistaken view. Mm -hmm. It's like you're stuck with the weeds because they're there. Oh, my God, I've got all these weeds. I must be a bad person. It's, too, it's just wrong. It's, just, it's always is explaining why it's there. Now, what will I do about it? That's the point. Do you understand? Good, 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 good. Yes. Yeah, yeah, your point. Yeah, go on. I forgot you. I think we're, we're sharing the same. Question. Oh, okay, go on then. Uh, but, um, so first, um, it seems to me that uh, development of mindfulness or shamatha is the way to increase agency in case in to increase one uh, our agency. So you know, in terms of uh, our karma being determined, right? Let's say we, you know, we have addiction. You know, it's a very strong karma of us not being able to stop that habit. That's right, sure. Then so, so the question A is, how do we practice to to have more control over my, our minds? That's right, yes. And second, can you speak a little bit about the the agency during the the moment of death or the bardo? You know, well, how do we? Create... I'm, I'm that part you've lost me completely. The agency in the bardo. What are you saying? Can we can we develop agency to to when? change? 
When? After we die. Oh, okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. So like I said over here, very first level of practice, Lord Buddha taught, don't worry about your mind yet. Control the servants of your mind, which is your body and your speech. So if you have a tendency to be angry and the like, words vomit out the mouth, there's no point in saying, oh, I'm so angry, I'm trying to control my anger, I can't control my anger. No, don't worry about controlling your anger. Control the speech first. This is a miracle of practice. That's how you use your mindfulness. You've got to watch your speech like a hawk. I mean, we don't even get this as a practice in our culture. It sounds so boring, but it's a miracle. Control the speech first, and that harnesses your energy. You're using all your mindfulness to control your speech. Now you have the luxury, because you've calmed the servant of the speech down, the anger, you can now get into the anger. It's just a more subtle level. That's how come it's taught in more at the next level of practice. It's verse is vows and discipline. Do you see my point? Can you have agency in the yet yeah, when you're an advanced practitioner? Of course you can. If you can go to sleep now and have complete control over your dreams and know exactly what's going on and then wake yourself up whenever you want to, and know, then you're, you're beginning to be able to work in the bodo. So you just have to learn to get concentration, of course, and then you won't get concentration. You'll be able to, absolutely. But even to be ready to get to concentration, we have to remember this. I remember a friend of mine that I mentioned, I think yesterday, Venerable Rene, the Swiss monk, who's been a meditator for like 40 years, 45 years. He did his first main retreat 10 years, I think, after he first met the Dharma. So he said there's no way in the world he would even have been ready to go to the mountains to get shamatha, which meant, you know, one, two years, eight, 10, 12, 14 hours a day, incredible discipline, unless he had done years of living in vows, years of purification, years of other practice, years of listening to the teachings, and even years of giving teachings. That was the preparation. So to even get to the point where you're ready to go to the mountains to get shamatha, you're a pretty high person already, you know. And that's controlling the energy of your body, speech, and mind, doing lots of purification, and controlling, you know, living in vows, living in vows, which is a tremendous purification. Do you understand? Good, darling, thank you. Good, good. Good. Who is it? Go, sweetheart. Talk to me. Oh, oh, it's me. She's in Australia. Hello, sweetheart. <laughs> Hello. How are you? Are you well? I'm all right. You too? You're all right. Yes, we're oh, all okay. right. Good, yes. Go on. In this right. moment. Okay. Um, I had an earlier question and then the conversations moved on a bit, which made me think of something okay. else. But I'll That's try. Right. On. Maybe one or the other can be answered rather than both. Okay, so one was when uh, someone was talking about environmental stuff and um, I thought about the five, is it the five hindrances? So like the difference between, um, oh, what are they? Um attachment and being um the five enemies no the near enemies i don't know what they are whose term is that isn't the near enemies i'm sure i learned that somewhere different, like different teachers difference. have different terms but different so, teachers use different terms darling so go on though keep talking okay so the the thing of like not being detached but a near enemy would be becoming indifferent Oh, okay, instance. this is very nice. This sounds like a very particular person's approach, and I like it a lot. It's very good. So go on, go on. Um, so yeah, I was just trying to remember those because I know that at various times remember. I've gone, yeah. I've thought, yes, no, that whole thing of like karma, that person who was talking about karma and where people yeah. so flippantly can say, oh, well, that's karma, and it's like, well, there's a fine line between that thing of being detached or having indifference towards yeah suffering. that's right exactly no, yeah. exactly this is very no it's a very good point it really is yeah exactly it becomes uh it still becomes fatalistic yeah it really is true yeah. very true and exactly i right. guess my understanding of karma um yeah. at my level of like ignorance mm. is um mm. well with some teachings though is that you know, karma isn't just linear in terms of this life. It's the mm. ripening at different times when the conditions are right for that ripening. That's exactly that right. That's right. Karma. Exactly. That's right. And, and it's very, then, very, it's very subtle and complex and nuanced. Yeah. Yes. And and um, the next point following on from that for me in yes. this whole conversation is um, 
that when I reflect upon my life and, as you know, meeting the Dharma early for whatever karma I had mm-hmm. for that, mm-hmm. I feel like earlier in my life I was more, for instance, I did have lucid dreaming and I could wake up in my dreams. Various things like that were much clearer, mm-hmm. much easier and then mm. I wonder if there's something around that as you come towards the later part of your life, um, that karmas are more likely, past karmas are more likely to manifest so that you can apply practice to them or you're more I ready. A little bit... That's interesting, Samia. No, it's, it's interesting. I think it's a bit like, I think it's a bit like um, you can be carrying on in your life, eating sort of fairly normal food, and you don't notice any problems. And then you decide to really get into sort of subtle levels of nutrition, and you go on a fast. It's like you get much sicker, but it's just a sign. It's a sign of purification. So in a way, it is like that. One of the signs that when you start to practice is you can have more problems. It's the karma ripening, and that is a, that can be a good sign. Yes, it's hard to deal with it, but it certainly can be. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So this is when you have to really dig much deeper and really exactly. focus around what you're talking about, really going back to the basics of, okay, right speech, right action. That's it, right, exactly, darling. exactly yeah. right. Understanding why it's happening and getting courage from it and not sinking into misery and self-pity and all that and, and mm. grabbing hold of grist for your milk. That's really true. Absolutely, Samia. Exactly. So to me that means that in a way, I'm paring back and becoming much more simplified around yeah, exactly. these are very exactly. simple points to keep practicing rather than more ad- not worrying about, oh, advance this or how it will be go. in the bardo, no, et cetera, et cetera. It's That's just right. basic. That's a good point. Yep, good. What you're saying is great. Keep moving. Yeah, down. I'm more checking in whether this is sort of on the right direction. I think you're going, in the, right, I think you're going in the right direction, yes. Pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sweetheart. I Thank you, sweetheart. keep trying. You, sweetheart. If it's helpful to other people, that's wonderful too. Yeah. Thank you. Exactly, darling. What else, people? Any questions? Any more questions? Yes. I have a Who's question. That? Good, sweetie. Talk to me. Um, is there a... <laughs> Where's the line between love and attachment? Oh, darling. Anything... I know how complicated that is, but anything you... I'd like to say to that. It's so incredibly hard, you know, because it's certainly in our culture, I think it's psychologically we we probably see them as the same, you know. So let's just say let's let's just look at this briefly. Okay. So and the key to understanding it is to understand this Buddhist model of the mind, which is quite distinct to Buddha, that distinguishes clearly between the eye-based, fear-based, neurotic constricted, miserable, painful, delusional, unhappy states of mind. And they are called attachment and anger and guilt and depression and anxiety that we know them. So we know them, but we sort of just think, oh, well, they're normal part of a normal person, so what to do? We're a bit fatalistic about it. But then we have to distinguish them from the other lot, which are our saving grace, kindness, love, empathy, compassion, generosity, forgiveness. So the characteristics of the unhappy ones is that they're narrow, they make us, when they're, when they're prevailing, there's fear, there's worry, fear, it's tight, it's constricted, and it's, it's miserable, it's plain miserable if they prevail. And if you can see one day love and kindness and generosity are prevailing, then they're the opposite. They're more spacious, they're connected to others, your mind is more uplifted, you're more positive. These are the characteristics, and we all can hear these words, but because they come together, we can't tell the difference. You know, so it's like when you're in love with somebody, which is intense attachment, attachment gone completely bonkers, you know. It also happens to be that this person, you do absolutely love them. So what is attachment? If you just had, okay, put it this way, with that person you're in love with, if it's mainly only attachment, then it won't last because in the beginning, the object is totally divine. You can't get it enough. You want to be in the bed 24 hours a day. You want to see him, hear him, taste him, touch him, smelling 24 hours a day. And then after a while, if there's not much love and kindness, you'll start to fight. He'll look ugly. You won't like his smell. And before you know it, you'll kill him 
or he'll kill you. <laughs> that because attachment is unsustainable. Attachment is exaggerating. Attachment distorts, and then it becomes exhausted. So if there's love there, it means you see this human being, you want them to be happy, you then have to you practice patience, you practice kindness, you practice forgiveness, and if there's going to be a relationship, that's what sustains the relationship. So attachment is neurotic, deluded, it, in the, it, it happens also to trigger a lot of joy, that's the problem, and that's the tricky part. It does trigger, contact with the object triggers incredible pleasure. It's true, we know that, but then if we can add love and compassion to the mix, that's when the practice has to start, you know. And attachment's totally self-centered, totally eye-based, so it's really hard to see it as different because it triggers, it does, I mean, in the first, just the first mouthful of cake is really pleasurable. So, of course, you think the cake is divine, and then you eat a second piece, wanting more pleasure, and it doesn't take long to realize the cake now is revolting, and if you had another mouthful, you'd vomit. It just takes longer with a human being to chuck them out, you know. <laughs> Are we communicating? So, the, the general characteristic yes. of the, the neurotic states of mind is they're eye-based, fear-based, worried, neurotic, and, you know, and, and in their nature, very distressed and narrow and constricted and small and then the virtuous states of mind are spacious, kind, open, connected. There's massive difference between them but the trouble is in the beginning when you're, or not even in the beginning, when you're attached to somebody and you also happen to love that person which is want them to be happy. That That's what that's why in relationships if there's not that much love why you fight and kill each other because love means patience, Humility, forgiveness, not doing what you want every time, doing what they want, that's what comes with virtue. And if attachment's very strong, that's why it's so difficult. Do you understand? So it's not a, yeah. there's a, there's a okay. between them, but because they're so mixed in our mind as one experience, we have to learn to distinguish between them, and it's very hard. But we can do it. Do you understand, darling? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. And it's painful. I mean, one of my sisters, she won't mind me talking, you know, she got married when she was 20 or met her husband who was 19. They were 19, they knew he'd get married, they had seven babies. He was 75, he got out emphysema and he died lately. And she said, I mean, she's been together with him for 50, what is that, 60 years, 50 years, 60 years, 50 years. Seven children, 27 grandchildren, great grandchildren, a life, you know, a life together. She said, the the pain is unbearable. That's not from love. That's from attachment. And that's not being critical. Yeah. We've all got it. It's not criticizing. It's just human nature. That's how can we suffer. If you didn't have attachment, this is the part that's so shocking, we wouldn't suffer. This is very hard to hear because we assume attachment is a normal part of a normal person, that you'd be weird if you didn't have it. Do you understand what I'm saying, people? And she said the pain is sometimes unbearable. Which means you, it's not as if you don't then, well, I'm not going to have a husband, I'm going to suffer. It's just the way life is, you know, unless you can learn to work with it. I mean, it's unbearable. I think about it, my dear sister, you know. The pain is sometimes unbearable, she said, you know. And that's the part that is, seems so strange and clinical to us because it's normal to hear that that's because you've got attachment. It sounds very cruel. It doesn't sound like you're criticizing. But we've got to do the analysis. This is Buddha's analysis of suffering. That's what he means by suffering. Which means we don't, it doesn't mean you then, oh, I'm not going to fall in love. You have to learn to work with it. If you have to be, if you have to distinguish between the two and learn to give up the attachment, which is incredibly hard. It's almost impossible in a way. I mean, how can you not have attachment for your beloved children, you know, most people? It's very hard. So attachment is so tremendous because it's so pervasive. So it's really, it seems like what's Buddha trying to tell us to do? Give it all up and then become nothing or something? It's too difficult, you know? And that's where when you get to the compassion wing, you can learn to use attachment. Even on the compassion, even the sutra teachings. By adding compassion, consciously adding compassion to the mix. It's very skillful psychologically. But the very first level of practice is be cautious, understand it, do the analysis, you know? Are we communicating? Do the 12 links. It's very, that 12 links is so contact, 
desire, contact, feeling, and, and attachment. That's just intense, you know. The, the, this process, this technical process, it's like an incredible analysis. I mean, you know the analysis. It's like anybody. You know, you can do the analysis of food. It might be very, very theoretical, but it informs your ability to know how to eat. So this is the analysis of the mind and how things happen. So it's a learning, you know. We just go, oh, it's natural. What good is that? <laughs> yeah. On the other thing about the love and attachment, about yeah. commitment and attachment. Commitment. What do you mean by that? Um, well, um, what do you mean by you commitment? Know, when you when you do love somebody, for instance, and you know that you go through the anger and all that sort of stuff, but you stay, you make the commitment. You mean you're talking about a person like a hubby? It could be a relationship, and it could be like um, commitment to Buddhism, and What's that it? you're attached to it. No, I don't know what you're talking about now. That's getting a bit different. It's a different kettle of fish, darling. What are you saying? Well, okay, so honey, child, if you if, put it this way, if you have attachment for your practice, then I rejoice for you. Well, but if it's only attachment, that means when you're meditating and your hubby comes on, you say, oh, "I'm trying to meditate. Go away. You'll be you'll last five minutes." If it's only attachment, it's not sustainable. So don't misunderstand attachment. Quite different. And anyway, when you get to the body's upper path, how marvelous that you can be attached to something that can be helpful to you. How lucky you are. Wow. No, I'm not. But if it's only attachment, which means you're exaggerating its delicious qualities, which means you think of it all the time in a neurotic way, that's not that's not practice, baby. You can't be attached to you can't be attached to giving up anger. Come on. You see what I'm saying? So don't use it like that. With people, sure, you have a relationship because the world is like that. You know, two people come together, you call husband, wife, or whatever you have now. It's more, it's more flexible now, isn't it? And you live together, so that's okay. You commit to, I mean, if you're going to be committing just to, yeah, you're committing to, I don't know, whatever you're committing to. You don't commit to attachment, you're committing to that person because you decide you're going to live together or something. I don't know. I mean, all power to you. I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I know when I was a kid, I. People talk about what you're going to do when you grow up and get married. And, I, and I, even though my mother and father did it, I think, what do you want to live in the same bed as another person? That was a horrific idea for me. I couldn't believe it. So I'd rather go to prison, you know, to live in the same prison, in the same house, even in the same bed as another person. I'm not trying to be rude to you. I know people find it very pleasurable. Like my darling sister, you know, for 45 years, living in the same bed with a hubby, you know. Close, loving, kind. I mean, incredible, of course. Yeah, wow. Anyway, what is the question? Who's asking the question? Yeah. Oh, I just want to, um, on the comments about love and attachment, something yeah. that came to mind was uh, it would be helpful to have a definition of what. Good. Love is a thought. May you be happy. Yeah. Attachment is a thought that exaggerates the deliciousness of the object. Yeah. They're the definitions. Yeah. One of the, I, I, a definition that came to mind was someone that I like also wrote about it who what had a practice. Um, Bell Hooks like said that it was um, one's capacity to expend to extend themselves for the benefit of others. Is that love? Yeah. Okay, so it's so sort of as a very wordy way to put it, isn't it? Yeah, nothing wrong. I like it. It's nice. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. But the interesting point is all these emotions come down to being concepts. So the bare bones concept would be saying may you be happy mm -hmm. and then the next level though is what can i do to make you happy that's the bodhisattva one mm -hmm. compassion is may you not suffer and then great compassion Mahakaruna, what can i do that's the powerful one so that's one she's saying is the, is the bigger one mm -hmm. yeah and attaches what do i get from it automatically it's necessarily i based necessarily that's the point necessarily i based and it's fear based and it constricts and it distorts and it exaggerates it doesn't make and it doesn't make you happy oh well, it's time to go home again look it's uh 10 to 9 i gave you 20 more minutes today 21 <laughs> more minutes thank you people we continue tomorrow and saturday and sunday we're going to get masses done we're going to go to the different practices. We're going to talk more about karma as well. But all this is part of the deal, isn't it? All of this is part of the deal. Where's Victoria? You doing okay, Victoria? Having a little think there?
All right, darling. Thank you, everybody. Maria, Rosanna, Sarah, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Venerable. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank you, sweethearts. Thank I'll you. I'll write to you soon. I'm going to email soon. Bye. Bye. Okay. All right, petals. Thank you, sweethearts. Jung Chub Sem Chogun Poche, Marke, Panam, Kegu Chi, Ke Panyam Pa, Me Pa Young, Gong Ne, Gong Du, Pogacho. And I think just we should say a wee little prayer, Blum's is coming back. Please, we must say that. Can we have a quick. Who's got a prayer? Bob, you got one there? Lama's over coming back. Dal Lama prayer. One Dal Lama wrote for Lama's over. We should be saying that. We should come back quickly. All the Geshis are top up doing their practices, aren't they? All chanting the names of Manjushi. We're doing that tomorrow. And tomorrow morning in the. Oh no. Chate in the Wampa. I'm going to do the, we're going to do the chanting the names of Manjushri at nine o'clock. That's my, I'm, I'm on schedule to do it at nine. So if you want to come and join me then. So have you got the prayer there? Green, sweetheart. So we'll just say this little prayer written by His Holiness Dalai Lama for the Lamas to come back quickly. On the screen coming in a minute. And if you don't know him, you know, I mean, you can also think it'd be nice to have him come back. He's a pretty useful person. <laughs> <laughs> Quite well known. <laughs> Lots of projects and things and helps people. Neil is teacher and a simply of the children of the victorious ones, Shravakas and Pratyaka <laughs> Torius, Lozang, father and sons, along with the lineage masters, all the objects of refuge of infinite land, please bestow the virtue and good. This aspiration, here and now. Holding and spreading the Moonies, to explanation, practice, that is never discussed. Comparable, venerable guru to you, I make request. While striving single pointedly for the sake of the victorious one's teachings, the sole gateway through which all benefit and happiness emerge, and from other living beings, you suddenly departed to peace. Such a great loss. Nevertheless, through the undeceiving truth of the blessings of the ocean of three jewels and the great waves of bodhicitta of the children of the victorious ones, may the smile of a reincarnation swiftly beam in glory for fortunate disciples. Okay, darling ones, and be ready to know that, you know, death will happen to us. So your practice is when you go to wake up in the, if, if you wake up in the morning, we all laugh because we think we will. If we wake up in the morning, we blissed out and notice, my God, I can't believe my petrol tank hasn't run out yet. I'm still alive. It's a really good practice because we assume we will wake up in the morning and we take it for granted when we wake up in the morning. Don't. It's like your, your petrol tank meter is not working. You turn on the motor and the, you're still petrol there. You can't believe it. Get excited. Amazing. I'm not dead yet. Then leap out of bed. I think I'm going to make the most of this day today so I can continue to be useful, benefit others, and work on my mind. And we'll all see you tomorrow. We'll carry on this discussion. Okay, people? Yep. Thank you, darling. Everybody, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, people on Zoom. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.